I'm Dale Markowitz, and today I want to talk about machine learning for developers in a hurry. And by that, I mean ML for people who want to take advantage of this awesome new technology, but do not want to embark on a multi months long endeavor where they have to learn a bunch of new things for a project that may or may not pan out. Now, at Google, I spend a lot of time building machine learning powered apps fast. And at this point, I have a pretty good nose for the types of projects that are going to succeed and that can be finished quickly, and the ones that are going to take forever or totally flop. So I'm going to share with you some of my best practices for doing ML fast. First, a quick reminder. What is machine learning? My unofficial definition is that it's the art and science of finding patterns in data, usually so that you can make predictions on new data. Why would you want to do that? Because machine learning enables us to do lots of things that traditional software can't, like spotting tumors in medical scans, or filtering spammy text, or catching fraudulent users, or recognizing people, places, and things in photos. Without machine learning, solving these problems in code would be nigh impossible. But how do you actually go about implementing ML in a way that's fast and effective? When it comes to speed, I probably don't have to tell you that timing software projects is incredibly, notoriously difficult. As soon as you start building something, you encounter all sorts of unknown unknowns. Now, the bad news is ML projects are even harder to time, and that's because there's an uncertainty inherent in doing machine learning. For one, if you're new to machine learning, and most software engineers are, You'll have to learn concepts and frameworks and tools, which, whenever you're learning something new, always introduces uncertainty. But in machine learning, as opposed to traditional software engineering, there's also this additional step of data collection, which can also be a really long part of the development process. And finally, all machine learning models are probabilistic, meaning that they're never, ever going to be 100% accurate. Unfortunately, it's often difficult to know how accurate or inaccurate a model is going to be until after you've already done all of the hard work of building it. So potentially, you spend a lot of time for a model that's not even accurate enough for your use case. And that all stinks. So how do you avoid falling into these traps? Now, the key, in my opinion, is to choose the right problems, which is to say to choose the problems uh, that you know ML will work on quickly and effectively, the low-hanging fruit. But how do we know what these good problems are? For me, I tend to ask myself three questions. So the first one is, is the problem I'm trying to solve a common one? More on that in a second. Do I have good tools to solve the problem? And then can I validate my machine learning model quickly on real data? Going back to that first question, is the problem I'm trying to solve common? Now, that might sound strange, but let me give you a parallel example from web development. Imagine trying to build an app that implements peer-to-peer -peer video streaming, like for video chat. Technologically, this is a pretty complicated networking problem if you're starting from scratch. But happily, P2P video is such a common use case that other smart networking people have solved the problem for you. So just by building off of others' work, you can construct this complicated video streaming app quite easily. And the same pattern is true for ML. So what are the problems that can be solved easily with ML because someone else has done the work for you? One would be transcription, that's speech to text. Localization, I'm talking about translation. Sentiment analysis, building conversational agents or chatbots. Image classification, smart search like on Google. And what is it that makes these problems easy? It's the fact that you don't have to go out and collect data and train your own model. You can borrow an existing model, like an open source model from TensorFlow Hub or one from Google Cloud. So for example, take translation. Uh, building a machine learning model to do really high quality translation is incredibly difficult. Usually, you need a huge data set of side by side translations, so millions of examples of sentences in English and their Spanish counterparts. And even if you were able to find a huge data set like this, you then need to train this big, sophisticated, expensive machine learning model on all of that data. And the same is true of speech to text. To train a transcription model, you also need tons of data. And like translation, it'd be a huge pain to train an accurate transcription model. However, as you can imagine, transcription and translation are such common use cases. And because of that, there are lots of great tools and APIs to make this easy for you. For example, here you can see code to translate a string of text using the Google Cloud Translation API, which is basically the API version of Google Translate. And as you can see, it's a very short snippet of code. We instantiate a translation client. We pass it a string of text that we want to translate along with the target language code, which in this case is ES for Spanish, and we get the translated result. Uh, the speech to text API and the text to speech API look very similar to this. And using these APIs uh, is one way that you can do ML without a lot of the headache that comes with doing ML. For example, by combining these APIs, uh, I was able to automatically transcribe, translate, and dub a bunch of YouTube videos. So I'm going to show you the result of this low effort, speedy ML project. Let's take a look. 
Mun pitää tehdä uuden vuoden lupaus. I have to make a New Year's resolution to eat less treats and play more sports. Ha habido empresas, organizaciones sin fines de lucro y o inst- There have been companies, non-profit organizations and educational institutes. So I always thought it would make sense to stick something simpler like software engineering. Ты додумал, что есть смысл приклеить что-нибудь попроще? So, I don't know what you thought about that. Some people might be okay with these translated voices, others might find them a little uncanny valley, but the important thing is that this prototype was really quick and easy to build, and once you have a proof of concept, you can then decide if this quality is would suit your use case. So now let me give you one more example of easy to do ML, and this time it's going to be from Vision, which is object tracking. So object tracking is a computer vision technique that lets us track the positions of objects in videos over time. Again, this is a very tricky ML problem to solve yourself, but it's kind of easy when you have somebody else's model to use, like in this case, the Video Intelligence API. So in this video, you can see some footage that my dad took from the GoPro on his motorcycle. So I pass his videos through the Video Intelligence API, which gives me these nice little bounding boxes that tag buildings and streetlights and cars as my dad is passing them. It took me all of 15 minutes to go from his video to these results, which is a very fast time to go from data to validation. Now, I just mentioned a bunch of Google Cloud AI APIs, which is a really great tool set because they're really high quality models built and maintained by Google. But if you want to take a completely open source approach to doing object detection, you can do that as well. For that, check out TensorFlow Hub, which is a repository of pre-trained, free to use, open source TensorFlow models. Here we're actually looking at an object detection model, and actually this is in TensorFlow.js, which means that you can do object detection directly in JavaScript in the browser. Now to reiterate, one of the biggest advantages to using pre-trained models is that they allow us to validate how well ML will work on our data really fast. So we can figure out, is this quality what we need it to be? Uh, which is another reason why common problems with turnkey solutions are going to be the easiest ones to tackle with ML. Now that being said, sometimes working on niche domain-specific problems is unavoidable. And what are these domain-specific problems? Some examples are forecasting sales, building product recommendation systems, fraud detection, customer segmentation. And what all of these problems have in common is that they're always going to be custom to your business and your use case. In this case, it's just going to be unavoidable. You'll have to use your own data to train your own model. And how difficult is that going to be? Well, it depends largely on how much work you have to do to go out and collect the data. Because often, building a model actually isn't the hard part. It's collecting the data, then pre-processing that data so it can be used in a machine learning model that takes the most time. The best possible case is when you already have all the data that you need, preferably somewhere easy to access like a database. So imagine, for example, that you are a credit card company and you want to be able to build a model that detects fraudulent credit card transactions. Probably you already have a neat history of transaction data, maybe in a data warehouse like BigQuery. So now I'm going to show you how you can easily build a machine learning model on top of that data using Vertex AI, which is Google Cloud's one-stop AI platform, and a part, a tool within Vertex AI called AutoML, which allows you to train a custom model without having to write any code. Let's take a look. So what you're looking at here is data in a BigQuery table, and this is all data from credit card transactions. Now what the different columns are has been anonymized. We're not sure exactly what these columns correspond to. But what you can see is in this class column at the end, so we have a bunch of zeros and ones which indicate whether the transaction was fraudulent or not. And as, as you can imagine, most transactions are not fraudulent, so the data set is skewed. Now we're going to train a model to predict whether a transaction was fraudulent, and we'll do that in Vertex. And the way that we do that is to import first the data set from BigQuery. So I'll create a new data set. I'll call it credit card transactions, and it's going to be a tabular data set. And I'm going to import the data directly from BigQuery. The table that I just showed you is called transactions. And here we can see what data was in that table. Most of it was floats, except for the class, which was an integer, that's the label. And it's very easy to train a model on top of this data. You just click the Train New Model button, and we're going to use AutoML, which means have Google design the model for us. We're just going to get the end result. Click Continue. Uh, we're going to make predictions about the label, which is called class, trans, uh, fraudulent or not. Then we click Continue. And I'm also going to select an advanced option here, 
which is called AUC PRC. What this does is because our data set is so skewed heavily towards non-fraudulent transactions, this sort of reweights the way the model trains so that it, it accounts for this skew. Then I click, click continue and I decide how long I want the model to train for, which I'm going to train it for one node hour and click start training. And now in the background, Google is handling the design and training of my machine learning model. So I'll show you what it looks like when that process finishes here in the models tab. Here's a credit card fraud model I trained uh, recently. Take a look at what we get in the console. So first we get the confusion matrix and a bunch of metrics describing to us how accurate the model is. And you can see that this model was very accurate. But once you've trained a model in Vertex, it's actually very easy to use it in a variety of ways. So the first one I'll show you is batch prediction. So this allows you to, once you've trained a model on BigQuery data, you can actually point it to another BigQuery table. So maybe all of the unlabeled transactions and have it make a prediction on that data. This is called batch mode because it's on like an already large data set. But if you wanted to use this model on the fly, for example, as people are making transactions, you want to be able to hit a rest endpoint with, uh, to get predictions from your model, we can actually click a single button to deploy the model to a rest endpoint so that we can use our model from within an app. And it's hosted by Google. So that is how you can train a model using Vertex AI without having to know almost anything about how to design machine learning models. Okay. So far, we talked about choosing good problems to solve by preferring common problems with turnkey solutions. And when that's not an option, preferring problems where you already have data and a user-friendly tool like AutoML to help you train a model and validate your model on the data ASAP. So OK, you use these criteria to choose a good problem. But you also need to make sure that you understand the limitations of ML and whether or not it's actually a good fit for what you want to do. For example, like I mentioned before, ML models always make mistakes. Always, because they're statistical tools and they make predictions and sometimes those predictions are wrong. So when you're designing your app, you need to either have a tolerance for error or you need to architect your app in such a way that error is contained. For example, if you're building an app that tags your dog's face in photos, then maybe it's okay if sometimes your model is wrong. But if you're building an app that tries to parse an important medical form, then approximately no error is okay, which means maybe you can use ML to speed up that use case but you need to ultimately have humans in the loop to verify the results. And I will finally lead you, leave you with one last piece of advice for designing ML apps, which is to scope your use of machine learning. Now, most software engineers know the concept of modularity. By breaking code down into small isolated components and testing those components, it's easy to know when an error occurs, what part of your app is it coming from. And exactly the same thing is true of machine learning. The most successful projects use ML for just one piece of the puzzle, like translating text or transcribing speech, or maybe we weave these components together. But the app is not going to be end to end completely controlled by AI, where when something goes wrong, you have no idea even where to start looking. So that's all I have to say for today. Though here are some helpful links if you want to learn more about building ML apps fast. And if there's just one thing I can leave you with, I hope it's the feeling that ML can be a very powerful tool if you're strategic in the ways that you decide to use it. That's all, and thanks for watching.